what is panpsychism? Like, what are the different ways you can uh, try to to think about, to define panpsychism, maybe in contrast to uh, uh, naturalistic dualism and materialism, and other kind of views of uh, consciousness? Yeah, so that you've basically laid out the different options. So I guess probably still the dominant view is materialism, that roughly that we can explain consciousness in, in the terms of physical science, wholly explain it just in terms of the electrochemical signaling in the brain. Dualism, the polar opposite view, um, that consciousness is non-physical outside of the physical workings of the body and the brain, although closely connected. Um, and, you know, when I studied philosophy, we were taught Basically, they were the two options you had to choose, right? Either you thought it you were dualist and you thought it was separate from the physical, or you thought it was just electrochemical signaling. And yeah, I became very disillusioned because I think there are there are big problems with both of these options. So I think the attraction to panpsychism is it's kind of a middle way. It agrees with the materialist that there's just a physical world. Ultimately, there's just particles and fields. But the pan panpsychist thinks there's there's more to the physical than what physical science reveals and that the ultimate nature of the physical world is constituted of consciousness. So consciousness is not outside of the physical as the dualist thinks. It's embedded in, um, underlies the kind of description of the world we get from physics. What, what to you are the problems of materialism and dualism? Starting with materialism, I... It's a huge debate, but I think that the core of it is that physical science works with a purely quantitative description of the physical world, whereas consciousness essentially involves qualities. If you think about the smell of coffee or the taste of mint or the deep red you experience as you watch a sunset, I think these qualities can't be captured in the purely quantitative language of physical science. And so as long as your description of the brain is framed in the purely quantitative descript quantitative language of neuroscience, you'll just leave out these qualities and hence really leave out consciousness itself. And then dualism? So I've actually changed my mind a little bit on this since I wrote the book. So I mean, I argued in the book that we have pretty good experimental grounds for doubting dualism. And roughly the idea was if dualism were true, if there was, say, an, an immaterial mind impacting on the brain every second of waking life, that this would really show up in our neuroscience. You know, there'd be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had no physical explanation. It would be like a, a poltergeist was playing with the brain. Um, but actually, and so, the, you know, the fact that, that we don't find that is a strong and ever-growing inductive argument against dualism. But actually, the, you know, the more I talk to neuroscientists and read neuroscience, and we, you know, we have at Durham, my university, a, an interdisciplinary consciousness group, I, I don't think we know enough about the brain, about the workings of the brain to make that argument. Um, I think we know, we know a lot about the basic chemistry, um, how neurons fire, neurotransmitters, action potentials, things like that. We know a fair bit about large-scale functions of the brain, what different bits of the brain do. Uh, but what we're almost clueless on is how those large-scale functions are realized at the cellular level, how it works. Um, you know, people get quite excited about brain scans, but it's very low resolution. You know, every pixel on a brain scan corresponds to 5.5 million neurons. And we're only... Um, we're only 70% of the way through constructing a connectome for the, for the maggot brain, which has, is it 10,000 or 100,000 neurons? But, you know, the brain has 86 billion neurons. So I think we'd have to know a lot more about how the brain works, how these functions are realized um, before we could assess whether they can be, the dynamics of the brain can be completely explicated in terms of underlying chemistry or physics. So, um, you know, we'd have to do more engineering <laughs> before we could uh, figure that out. And there are people with other proposals. Um, someone I got to know, Martin Picard at Columbia University, 
who has the uh, psychobiology mitochondrial lab there and is experimentally exploring the hypothesis that mitochondria in the brain should be understood as sort of social networks perhaps as an alternative to reducing it to underlying chemistry and physics. So so I, I, I'm less... It, it is ultimately an empirical question whether dualism is true. I'm less convinced that we know the answer to that question at this stage. I think still, as scientists and philosophers, we want to try and find the simplest, most parsimonious theory of reality. Um, and dualism is still a, a pretty inelegant unparsimonious theory, you know, reality is divided up into the purely physical properties and these consciousness properties and they're radically different kinds of things. Whereas the panpsychist offers a much more simple unified picture of reality. So I think it's still the view to be preferred, you know, to put it very simply, why believe in two kinds of things when you can just get away with one? And materialism is also very simple, but you're saying it yeah. doesn't explain something that seems pretty important. Yeah, so I think materialism can't, you know, we try, science is about trying to find the simplest theory that accounts for the data. I don't think materialism can account for the data. Maybe dualism can account for the data, but panpsychism is simpler. It can account for the data and it's simpler. What is panpsychism? So in its broadest definition, it's the view that consciousness is a fundamental um, and ubiquitous feature of the physical world. Like a law of physics, what should we be imagining? What do, you, what do you think the different flavors of how that actually takes shape in the context of what we know about physics and science and the universe? So in the simplest form of it, the fundamental building blocks of reality, perhaps electrons and quarks have incredibly simple forms of experience and the very complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow rooted in or derived from these very simple forms of experience at the level of basic physics. But I mean, the, maybe the crucial bit about the kind of panpsychism I defend, what it does is it it takes the, the standard approach to the problem of consciousness and turns it on its head, right? So the standard approach is to think, um, we start with matter and we think, how do we get consciousness out of matter? So I don't think that problem can be solved for reasons I've kind of hinted at. We could maybe go into more detail. But the panpsychist does it the other way around. They start with consciousness and try to get matter out of consciousness. So the idea is basically at the fundamental level of reality, there are just um, networks of very simple conscious entities. Um, but these conscious entities because they behave, they have very simple kinds of experience. They behave in predictable ways. Through their interactions, they realize certain mathematical structures. And then the idea is those mathematical structures just are the structures identified by physics. So when we think about these simple conscious entities in terms of the mathematical structures they realize, we call them particles, we call them fields, we call the, their properties mass, spin, and charge. But really, there's just these very simple conscious entities and their experiences. So in this way, we get physics out of consciousness. 